Good evening, ladies. It's really lovely to have you with us again this evening in our ladies' Bible study. Just wanted to tell you all again how much I'm missing you and missing meeting together around God's Word. But I trust that the Lord will give us the grace that we need for another month of lockdown and that this Bible study will continue to be helpful to you. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer right at the outset and let's ask Him to be with us this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that even when we are chained, when we are locked up, that your word is never chained. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are God this evening. We thank you, Lord, that your word is eternal. Unlike us who are like the flowers of the field that wither and fade, the word of our God stands forever. Lord, tonight we come before you because we know that we need your grace to be able to understand any truth from your word. And I pray, Lord, that you will give us that grace this evening, that we would be able to understand what it is you want to say to us tonight. And I pray that this Bible study tonight will be helpful to all of us. We ask that in your name and for Jesus' sake. Um, well, we're still busy in our special Philippians 1 lockdown study, and we've been looking at Philippians chapter 1 and seeing that Paul says to depart and be with Christ is better by far, and that to die is gain. Paul has a biblical perspective of death. He sees death as his servant that will lead him into glory. And I hope that by now you've at least seen something of the vital importance for all of us as God's people to think about and to meditate often upon our own death and our mortality, as well as our hope of heaven. It really does give amazing perspective. And we've really been considering over the last three weeks, last two weeks and tonight, this whole matter of the Christian perspective on death. We've already looked at something of our own frailty, the frailty of our lives here, and the certainty and imminence of our own death. Last week we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, you may remember, to see what the Bible teaches about what happens to us as Christians when we die. Now tonight, I want us to continue this theme by looking at the other side of the coin. What about those that are left behind? If death is gain, then should we refrain from grieving for those who pass on, for a Christian loved one who dies? We looked last week at what to die is gain does mean. Tonight we want to get to what to die is gain does not mean. Solomon says, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, and the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. So Solomon says that because death is the destiny of every man, the living should take that to heart. What does to die is gain not mean? Well, first of all, it does not mean that a Christian should desire death just because they hate life. Paul didn't hate life. On the contrary, he was always filled with joy. Even though he was in these present circumstances in prison, he tells in verse 18 of chapter 1, I rejoice, yes, I will rejoice. He had learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance, he says in chapter 4. He viewed life as sweet fellowship with Christ. He said to live is Christ. And he found joy in serving the Lord Jesus. Sometimes when life is difficult, or when a person suffers from chronic pain, 
or some disease, they may long for relief and then they may be tempted to take their own life. Sometimes even godly people get into such a state of depression that they would rather die than live. The Bible is full of examples of that. You can think of Moses, who was just so tired of dealing with those stubborn Israelites that he asked God to take his life. There's Elijah after that Mount Carmel victory. Jeremiah sitting in the pit. Jonah in angry rebellion against God, wishing God would take his life. Job. They all hit low points where they asked God to take their lives. But suicide is never God's will for anyone. It doesn't exalt Christ. The way Paul says he wants his death to do here in chapter 1. It is a selfish act. It is done in disregard to those who are left behind, who are left to grieve. So I just want to make it clear tonight that it would be wrong to interpret Paul's words here, to die is gain, as a go-ahead for suicide. Christians should love life. They should view it as an opportunity to serve the Lord thankfully. Thinking on our death doesn't mean a morbid preoccupation with it or wishing for it as some kind of escape mechanism from life's difficulties. Knowing that we're all going to die doesn't mean that, we, that it's wrong to go and seek to extend our lives through any proper medical procedures or medical help when we face a life-threatening illness. But as Christians, our motive for wanting to extend our lives should be so that we can further serve the Lord. As Paul says, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. It will mean fruit for my labor. The point is, God wants us to live life to the fullest, to serve him joyfully for as long as he gives us life. So Paul wasn't morbid or suicidal, but Paul was expendable. He says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. He's saying here, Look, I'm here to serve the Lord. And if God wants to call me to heaven, well, that suits me fine, because I know that I'll be with the Lord. So that's the first thing that death is gain does not mean. Secondly, to die is gain does not mean that a Christian should never grieve over the death of loved ones. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment, but we need to remember that until Christ, Christ returns, death really is our last enemy. It is a conquered enemy, but it is an enemy nonetheless. No one looks forward to the process of dying. And death is a thief that robs us of the presence of our loved ones. Scripture never condemns grieving. In fact, it tells us to weep with those who weep. The difference is that Christians don't grieve as those who do not have any hope. They do, however, still grieve. It's not unspiritual to grieve or to weep at the death of a loved one. The idea that you shouldn't grieve is really a product of stoicism or unhealthy, ungodly Greek philosophy. It's not a biblical perspective. We'll look at that in more detail in a moment. But thirdly, to die as gain does not mean that a Christian spurns everything that has to do with this world. Not being overly wrapped up in these concerns of the world, like what shall we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we wear, in education and beauty and physical health, and all those things we've mentioned before that shouldn't preoccupy our time, does not mean that, they should, that we shouldn't spend any time on them at all. 
We are in the world, after all. We have to live here whether we like it or not. We have to work to eat. And education is important. And how we dress isn't entirely unimportant. The point is, however, that we are not to be of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. And I love the illustration that uh, Steve Lawson uses, where he speaks of this in terms of us being or sailing in the boat on the sea or on the lake. The lake being the world, the sea being the world. We sail in the boat on the sea of the world, what we need to do is to be careful that we don't get any of the water into the boat. In other words, keeping death in mind helps us to keep our focus right. It helps us not to spend too much time on temporal things, more time on temporal things than on the eternal things. It helps us to strive to do all in our power to do whatever we do to the glory of God. It helps us so that we are in this world for the sake of winning the Lord Jesus, winning others to the Lord Jesus. That's our purpose for being here. And as Paul says, when that task is complete, when God's work for me here is done, then to die is gain. But now, so far we've been looking at our own death and as a, that as a future reality for us. Uh, maybe even if it's just one minute away, I don't know, I might drop dead before this Bible study ends. We'll be looking at our own death as a future reality so far. And how that future reality should affect how we live now. But now tonight, what about those who are left behind? What if you are the bereaved party? How do we minister to those who are bereaved, to those who are grieving. That's what I want us to look at tonight. And it's an important question, because though death is gain for a Christian, and though there is in one sense rejoicing when a Christian loved one gets to go home to be with Jesus, it is still the result of God's curse on this world and on sin. And therefore it is still the last enemy. It hurts. It destroys. It, 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 death is a terrible thing. And it is not wrong for those who are left behind to grieve, to hurt deeply at the loss of a loved one. In fact, not to grieve properly is decidedly harmful, as I hope to show you. Seeing death as gain for the Christian is an important truth to meditate on, to prepare us for death and to help us to live properly now. But it should never make us insensitive and unsympathetic to those who have experienced the loss that death brings. I say again, to fall into that trap is not Christian. It's Greek philosophy or Stoicism, but it is not biblical. Jesus wept. He wept with Mary and Martha at Lazarus' tomb, even though he knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. In John 11, we're told that Jesus wept. And, and the word used in John 11 verses 33 and 38 for the grief Jesus expressed at the loss of Lazarus indicates a deep turmoil, even an anger that death had claimed another victim. It was, after all, this very enemy, death, that Jesus had come to destroy. As we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, where Paul says, Our salvation has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 to 26, he says, For he, that is Jesus, must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And further, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 
verse 13, Paul says, we don't grieve like the rest of men do. We have hope, but we still grieve. I think much of the difficulty that comes with dealing with this matter of grief is rooted in our ignorance of what is normal and natural. And so when it does happen, we're just not sure how to handle it in ourselves or in others. So let's look tonight first at what grief is, what is involved in the process of grieving, and then how we can handle it and minister to others who grieve. First of all, let's look at how to understand grief. What is grief? I got this definition from J. Adams, Christian counselor J. Adams. He says, grief is a universal, complex, and painful pro process of dealing with and adjusting to loss any kind of loss. It involves a powerful emotional upheaval. In the New Testament, the word for grief is lupe, which means pain. And J. Adam says, and I quote, in this word, the physiological effect of the emotion is prominent, stressing the unpleasant visceral, that is the inward or internal and other bodily responses to the shock of a loss that brings about life-shattering effects. True grief, he says, tears apart one's former patterns of life, as well as causes sorrow over the loss of a loved one. And so grief is therefore a doubly painful experience. Do you see what he's saying? Not only do you lose the loved one, but you lose the normal pattern of life that you've become used to. It feels as though a hole has been torn into your soul that cannot be mended. And of course, the more we've invested in the relationship to the deceased, the greater the impact of the stress and pain of that separation will be on us. It is always linked to the quality of the relationship. For example, many people feel little or no loss at the death of a grandmother because they just didn't know her very well. But when my grandmother died, it was extremely painful for me. It was traumatic, it was life-changing because of the closeness of my relationship with her and because of what she meant to me in my life. When she died, I lost someone of irreplaceable value to me. And so her death left me with a very deep reason to grieve. In this way, all our losses are a way for God to force us to see what we're really hanging on to for our security. Are we hanging on to God? Or are we hanging on to others? Or even our own sense of control over our circumstances? Losses have a way of forcing us to see what we're really hanging on to for security. Also understand tonight that grieving is a very confusing and disorienting post process that takes time and work. It is not something that people get over so much as though it is something that they must work through. And it is normal. It is part of being in a sin-cursed world in which everything is groaning because of sin and is desired to be redeemed. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit we have that down payment, that guarantee of life with God forever one day, 
Even so, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. In fact, as I said earlier, not to grieve properly at the loss of a loved one is actually unhealthy and will inevitably lead to problems later on. So it is normal. And in order to work through grief, and work implies effort, people need to be made aware of the general stages through which we will all pass on a road to acceptance. But understand tonight that these stages are by no means set in concrete. You have to understand that they not only vary from person to person, but they vary in duration and in order. And they don't always follow on consecutively, one after the other, as though one stage of grief will be over and then the next one will carry on. They often overlap and they are more like cycles through which a person will move again and again and again until they reach acceptance. C.S. Lewis, in his very good book um, on grief, called A Grief Observed, in which he describes his own grief at the death of his wife from cancer, says, in grief, nothing stays put. One keeps emerging from one phase, but it always recurs round and round. Everything repeats. There's only a problem if someone gets stuck in one or more of these reactions for a long period of time. And I stress the word long because for most people, grieving takes a lot longer than anybody ever has the patience for. We all wish, don't we, that the person would just hurry up and get over it because we're so uncomfortable with death. We need to expect this process to be long. Now what are the recognized stages of grief? Well, the following reactions have generally been recognized in response to grief. You all, I'm sure, are familiar with them. Shock, denial, anger, guilt, bargaining, depression, submission, reinvestment, if we take all of those, we could probably divide this grief work into four main stages. Let's have a look at them. First of all, there is stage one. That is accepting the reality of the loss. And during this stage, the reactions of shock and denial are going to be the main ones that must be worked through. The initial stage of shock may last several days or even weeks, depending on the circumstances in which the person died, whether it was an accident, a sudden death, or perhaps after a long illness. In dealing with death, we have to face the truth, the reality that that person that we love is really gone. Even when death comes after a long sick bed, there's always that sense that this isn't really happening, that it's a bad dream, that it can't be true. And so we need to expect the reaction of shock at the news of the loss. It's that initial defense mechanism that God has given us to carry us through under some very dramatic and traumatic circumstances. It helps cushion us it helps us to survive and to, and to function under the emotional overload of grief. And ladies, it should not be grabbed away by well-meaning friends or too quickly eased by drugs. It should be allowed to take its course because the loss must be faced head on. And in this regard, you need to remember that rational explanations at this time are worthless because the soul of that person is in just too much pain to think rationally. That's one of the reasons why I really believe that viewing the body of the person who has passed away is 
is a very helpful thing. Even though it is extremely difficult, it is helpful in the sense that it helps us to not deny the fact of the loss. We'll be confronted with the loss in the body of that person. And yet too, it is also my strong feeling that a graveside service and the actual burial of a coffin is far more helpful in this grieving process because it forces our minds to accept the reality far more helpful than cremation, for example, which happens out of sight, out of view, where we can't even see it. You see, it's important that we accept the reality. Now, denial is also a part of the stage. And the denial comes as a refusal to believe, to, to really believe the never againness of the loss. And so, for example, you find at this stage that parents will often leave the room of the dead child exactly the way it was for weeks after they die. Or a wife may leave her husband's clothes hanging in the cupboard or his toothbrush in the bathroom. It is not unusual. It only becomes a problem if the person stays stuck there for years. So that's the first stage. The stage of accepting the reality of the loss involving shock and denial. Secondly, we have the second stage which is feeling the loss and it is during this time that all the feelings come. You know, Christians sometimes have the wrong idea that grieving shows a lack of faith. This is not true. Because even though we don't grieve the way the rest of the world does without hope, our hope doesn't lessen the emotional upheaval or the intensity of our pain. And so during this stage, all the feelings come. Feelings like sadness and anger and guilt and anxiety and loneliness and fatigue and helplessness and numbness. Often sleeplessness occurs. Thinking is confused. There may be a loss of appetite or, or social withdrawal or absent-mindedness or, or looking for the deceased where you expect the deceased to come through the door at any moment and then, of course, there's the renewed shock when they don't. There may be crying and, as I said, anger. Anger at the person who died. Why did you leave me? Perhaps anger at God. Why me? Why now? This is unfair. Even anger at themselves, which is normally anger turned inward in the form of guilt. If only I had been there, then this wouldn't have happened. Or if only I had been so selfish, I would have been there to, to be with them while they died rather than leaving them to die on their own. Don't be alarmed if some of these things begin to happen. It is a healthy part of the grieving process. It is again, once again, let me say, it is only if these feelings continue for a very long period of time, when they distort, disturb the normal functioning of a person's life, that we should be concerned that a person is perhaps stuck in any one stage and in need of help to move on again. During this stage <clears throat> will also be the stage when depression hits the person as they try and work through the loss. Depression is normal, but if necessary, medical help should be sought to keep the person from ending up with a clinical depression, a, a biological and chemical depression um, in this regard. And anger in this stage, as I've said, is also normal, especially for sinful people like ourselves. The person may express the anger at those closest to them about issues that are totally unrelated. And we need to be aware of this 
so that we can know why they are responding that way and so that we can gently help them to see that that's why they are responding that way. But under no circumstances should anger be suppressed. I remember that when Kali's dad passed away, his mom had to go and stay with one of his brothers and, and his wife. And they were in the kitchen one evening and his brother's wife said something and the next minute Kali's mom got so angry she picked up a tin of jam and threw it at her daughter-in-law. And everyone was surprised at why she did that because by nature Kali's mom is an extremely calm person, a, a very peaceful kind of person who never overreacts like that. And you see, this is what we're talking about here. When those kinds of reactions happen, we need to realize that it's part of the normal process of grief. And it shouldn't be suppressed. We need to help that person work through that. Otherwise, it could end up in physical illness or even depression later on. Rather, anger should be admitted to, it must be faced, but it must be worked through. For example, maybe confession needs to be made to God for the way we've expressed our anger in sinful ways towards others. Because even though it is normal, it is still wrong. And we need to confess that to the Lord. Perhaps confession needs to be made to God in terms of any failures that we feel we've had in our relationship with that person. Or maybe feelings of bitterness that have crept into our hearts. Perhaps against the doctor that was involved. Or the other driver in the accident. Or even at God himself. And when these feelings of anger turn inward into forms of legitimate or even non-legitimate reasons for being the cause of someone's death, we need to confess that guilt to the Lord and say, Lord, this is how I feel. I feel guilty because of what I did or didn't do. I feel like it's my fault. Confess it to the Lord. Work through it. Deal with it. Perhaps there was a whole lot of emotional baggage left behind when the loved one passed away. Things and issues in the relationship which weren't dealt with. It might be helpful for the person who is grieving to in some way tell the deceased how they hurt them and how they hurt the deceased in some way. Or perhaps they can write a letter to the deceased or visit the grave and speak to the person or with whatever way, just clear the air, deal with it, speak about it. And they should be encouraged to do this in a godly way, ladies. There's a lot of people around today who say we can just let go of our emotions and do whatever we want. That's not godly. We need to deal with it in a godly way. But we need to deal with it. We can't hide our anger from God. He sees our hearts. So we need to confess it and deal with it biblically. That's the way to emotional health. Thirdly, the third stage is learning to live with the loss. This is the stage during which the person will be gaining perspective on the loss. It's the time when the pain begins to soften and it's replaced by a sweet sadness. The acute sense of loss changes from, from being a moment-by-moment -moment thing, a moment-by-moment -moment preoccupation, to being a kind of episodic sadness, which is evoked by special circumstances. This is the stage of learning to adjust to the changes that the loss brings. During this stage, ladies, we must be very sensitive to those who have lost a loved one especially sensitive to those special days, those anniversaries, days like Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day. 
I remember before Kali and I uh, received our children, we adopted all our children because we couldn't have children. And that was a loss, something I had to grieve about. I remember how difficult Mother's Day used to be for me, especially when you're in church and on every Mother's Day, we do something special for the mothers. And here I was, and I knew that I could never be a mother. It used to be a really difficult day for me. And yet in our previous church, I remember so well, one of the ladies was a school teacher. And she got her whole class one year to make me a Mother's Day card. And to tell me how special I was and how much they were praying for me that the Lord would give us a baby because we were in the process of adoption. Now that means so much to me. In fact, I still treasure those cards. I still have them stacked away and stored away somewhere. But this is what I'm talking about here. Being sensitive to those special days because they become triggers of sadness for the person who's left behind. During this stage, often Christians will begin to see some of God's purposes behind their loss. They'll begin to see some ways in which the Lord has been using it for good in their lives. There will be a submission to His will and a willingness to move on again with life without that person in their life, without that companionship. This is often where the person needs to be reassured that acceptance is not trying to block the loss out of their minds. Sometimes people at this stage will be afraid that if they stop grieving, then they'll forget that person. They'll lose them permanently. They may even feel guilty at this stage about beginning to enjoy life again without that person. And so we need to assure them that it is normal and natural and good to accept the loss. Now let's look at stage four, the last stage, which is reinvesting in love. During this stage, there will be a desire to move out towards others again in acts of love. It's a good sign that the stages of grief have been worked through because if a person refuses to move towards others in love, it's likely that it's because they're afraid to risk loving again because they'll get hurt through losing someone else. You see, love has a price, a price tag, as the title of Elizabeth Elliot's book puts it. Love always has a price tag. You cannot ever love someone without the inevitable pain that will come when they are gone. The Christian who has worked through grief through a significant loss and has found the comfort of God and God in his word and in his purposes is equipped like no one else to now move out in love to minister to others who are hurting. Once you've received comfort from the Lord, once you've worked through your own grief, seen something of God's purposes in your life through it, you are equipped amazingly to now reach out in love to others who are hurting. You will have a new sympathy for the world's wounded. You'll have insight into their pain. And so this is really one good result of God's allowing sorrow in our lives. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also the com through Christ our comfort overflows. He says, if we are distressed, it is for, our com for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, 
so also you share in our comfort. Well, now that we've seen something of what normal grief looks like, how can we help those who are grieving? Most of us feel uncomfortable about death and the mourner's feelings. We spend most of our lives trying to avoid death, and trying to insulate ourselves from pain. And so when we're confronted with someone else's raw grief, we usually try to keep our own pain and discomfort to a minimum by staying away. Now ladies, this is selfish. And it really shouldn't be that way in the church. We are, after all, the family of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. But then he says, mourn. Literally, weep or lament or wail with those who mourn. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in his analogy of the body, the body being a, a, a picture of the church, he says, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. And then he says, if one part suffers, Every part suffers with it. And we, we have our precious Savior as our example, don't we, ladies? Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He was willing to enter into the pain of his friends, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And in Isaiah 53 verse 3, we are told that he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, which makes him eminently qualified to be our great high priest, who is touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, our infirmities, our sorrows, our griefs. And so, ladies, we should all be willing to be involved in this. We should make an effort to familiarize ourselves with the following principles, the following tips, in order to help those who are hurting. First of all, tip number one, be sensitive. You know, sometimes well-meaning Christians unknowingly trample all over a mourner's pain by glibly saying things like, oh, well, you know, he's much better off now. I mean, he's with the Lord, after all. Or, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. God is in control. And I say glibly, beware of using these things glibly, because... Scripture truths quoted sensitively and carefully are nevertheless invaluable reminders of God's comfort and God's purposes to a grieving person, especially a Christian, if they're given at the right time and in the right way. Be careful of trying to trivialize the pain that that person is feeling or to minimize the value of their loss. As Ecclesiastes 5 says, let your words be few, especially initially. There will be more than enough time later to talk. Your presence and your practical help is going to mean far more at this stage than anything else. Please be very careful of saying, I know what you're going through. <laughs> as though I've been there and done that. Just be the presence of Christ to those who are grieving as his ambassadors, a shoulder to lean on, to cry on. 
a willingness to listen, and a commitment to be there for the person. Those who are grieving know that you can't change the situation. What they want to know is, will you walk with me along this painful path that I have to travel? They feel abandoned by their loss. And the last thing that they need now is to feel abandoned by others around them. They need true friends who will listen, not only with their ears, but with their hearts. Those who are going to be willing to reach out to them with the love and the comfort of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think at this stage, early on, practical support is also very, very important in those little things. Taking a meal, or if it is a widow, fixing that leaking tap, or changing the oil of their car. Perhaps giving financial aid, especially if the assets have been frozen in the estate. Perhaps going and cleaning the house for them or looking after their small children. All these things are far more helpful at this stage, the early stages of grief, than all our wise words. So first of all, be sensitive. Secondly, realize that grief lasts longer than you think. Grieving takes far longer than anyone ever has the patience for. You often hear people saying something like, Oh, my friend's stuck in grief. She's just not getting over it. And then when you press them a little bit about what they mean by this, they'll say, Oh, well, you know, her husband died 14 months ago already and she's still very depressed. Isn't it about time that she moves on with her life? Now the problem here is not so much that the person is stuck in grief, but that her friends don't realize how long it takes to heal and to rebuild after a heart-wrenching loss. Understand that it is usually 6 to 18 months after the loss that it is the most difficult time for the person who's grieving. Because <clears throat> by this time, Loved ones who have been surrounding that person and reaching out to that hurting person have left. And this is the stage when numbness begins to disappear and reality begins to sink in. The reality that life has now changed forever. And while you may think that one year is after a death is plenty of time to get over it, plenty of time to grieve, the reality is that for the person who's hurting, the hurt may even be worse after one year. In fact, generally speaking, it takes up to two years, at least two years, and up to five years for someone to work through grief. And one reason it takes so long is because of the emotional setbacks that are also part of the process. For example, someone whose husband died three years ago, may go into a department store or shop and pass the cosmetics counter and they catch a whiff of their husband's favorite cologne or aftershave. And just that smell, within seconds, can open up the wound all over again. And that is normal. Sights, sounds, smells, even memories can trigger emotional setbacks. And so rather than getting impatient and feeling tempted to say, shouldn't you be over this by now? He's gone, you know, you can't bring him back. Rather than saying these things, perhaps it would be far better to be patient and say, I can't begin to imagine what you must be going through. Please know that I care. So grief lasts much longer than we think. Thirdly, everyone grieves differently. <laughs> All grief is unique because every person is unique. And the quality of the relationship with the deceased person is unique. Some prefer to have a steady stream of visitors and phone calls when they grieve. While others prefer to draw aside with perhaps the occasional visitor. They want to be by themselves. So don't compare losses. I remember something that hurt me quite 
significantly when my grandmother died and then later, two years later, when my father died, was the fact that people would compare my loss to that of my mother. I mean, after all, it was her mother and her husband who died. As though I needed to be strong because somehow my grief for my grandmother and for my father was less than that of my mother. It's not less significant. Don't compare losses. Each person grieves uniquely. Fourthly, keep the stages of grief in mind. Those stages that we've been looking at tonight. Bear them in mind. Because even though we're all unique, we will pass through the stages of grief. And so don't be alarmed or upset when a person, for example, doesn't want to pack the deceased's things away. Or when they express those feelings of anger or guilt or resentment. Try and understand their reaction. Be that shoulder for them to vent on, to cry on. Be there for them. And then fifthly, remember that grief is not the time to make major decisions. Life is in the process of adjusting. That person is in a process of working through grief. And the person should be very gently encouraged not to make any major life decisions during this time. They need time to work through their grief, to gain perspective again, before they can make any kind of decisions that have lasting consequences for them. And I'm talking here about things like perhaps selling the house and moving elsewhere, or even remarrying. Um, unless it is a decision that they, they have to take that is not in their own hands, these kinds of major decisions should rather be put on hold until the person has worked through their grief. And then lastly, and very importantly, pray for them. This is the most important thing you can do for someone who is grieving. Because ultimately we can only get that close to a person. But Jesus Christ can come with the comfort that only he can give. So lift up your Christian brothers and sisters to the Lord. Ask him to come and comfort their hearts, to bring them healing and perspective. So how do we give hope? How do we give hope? Because hope is the antidote to despair. Without hope, grief tends to move towards despair. How do we give hope? to those who have experienced death's merciless hands in, in their lives in the loss of a loved one. And once more tonight we see the difference that Christ makes here. How do we give hope to an unbeliever? Well, ladies, if the person who has passed away does not know the Lord, and you're not sure that he knows the Lord, you cannot give that person the assurance that that person is in heaven. Or some better place. Rather, we need to seek to point the unbeliever who is grieving back to Jesus Christ and his resources to make it through their grief. They need the gospel. It needs to be shared very sensitively, very lovingly, but they need the gospel. They need the comfort of Christ. And here I think the example of how we as Christians grieve is invaluable. It really should make the world sit up and ask, well, why are you so different? And once more this evening, I don't want to lose this opportunity. If you are watching this video this evening and you've experienced the death of a loved one and you don't know the comfort of Jesus Christ in your life, you don't know the comfort and hope that Jesus Christ can bring you, I want to urge you tonight to run to Jesus Christ. Fall on your knees before him. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because even though he doesn't promise to take away all of us difficulties and pain, he does promise to give us himself. And with Jesus, anything that life throws at us is bearable. So I urge you, turn to Jesus Christ if you haven't already. But you know, ladies, 
we can give so much hope to those who are believers. If the, the one who has lost a loved one is a Christian, and if the one who has died has gone to be with Jesus Christ because he knows the Lord, there's plenty of hope. And that's what we've been focusing on for the last few weeks. Death is an enemy that hurts us. It causes very deep pain to those who are left behind. But it's a conquered enemy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And if in Christ, in this life we only have hope in Christ, then we are more to be pitied than all men. But... Christ has indeed been raised from the dead in first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And therefore we have hope. He says in verses 51 to 57, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with, and when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the Lord, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Frank Peretti has a wonderful illustration that he uses in this situation. Imagine there's a family going on a holiday. It's a lovely day and they're cruising down the highway. It's a warm day and so the windows are turned down. And suddenly a big black bee comes into the car through the window. And the little, little girl sitting in the back seat is absolutely terrified. She screams because she's allergic to bee stings. Daddy, Daddy, there's a bee in the car. It's going to sting me. I'm going to die. And of course, the dad knows the danger and the seriousness of this. And with one hand, he's driving the car. And with the other hand, he's trying to catch the bee. And finally, the bee lands on the windshield. And he puts his hand onto the windshield. And captures the bee and then cups it in his hand and then the father waits the bee is going and he waits and he waits for the inevitable and ah! <laughs> he opens his hand and he lets the bee go and the little girl carries on daddy daddy there's a bee in the car it's going to sting me and the dad reaches his hand back and he says no darling look in my hand look what i've got in my hand it's the sting the bee doesn't have a sting anymore. You don't have to fear. Now, ladies, that's what Jesus did for us. He took the sting of death, the sting of sin. And after the cross, when he was raised from the dead, he shows us his palms and he says, Look at my scars. See what I have in my hand for you. I have the sting of sin, the sting of Satan. There's nothing to fear. Jesus has reduced sin and Satan to a big old black bee. And all he can do is, without a sting, and all he can do is buzz. The sting is gone. Death no longer takes us to condemnation, but to glory. And because Jesus has taken the, the sting in his hand, the, the sting of sin and the punishment we deserve for our sin, and because he's been raised from the dead and has conquered death, even though we hurt and grieve deeply at the loss of a loved one, we have hope. It is not the end. We will meet at Jesus' feet. They are not lost. They've just gone on before. Hudson Taylor, after his wife Maria died, after having just buried their 17-day-old son, Noel, and having buried their 8-year-old daughter, Gracie, three years before, and their 6-year-old son, Samuel, just uh, five months before, he wrote from a friend's house where he had gone to recover from his own dysentery. And he says, 
A few months ago, my house was full, now so silent and lonely. Gracie, Samuel, Noel, my precious wife with Jesus. The older children far, far away, they'd sent them home to England for education. And even little Charles, their one-year-old son whom they had kept with him, who had been left with friends in, in his, at his home in Yangsu, was not with him. Often of late years has duty called me from my loved ones, but I've returned and oh, so warm has been the welcome. Now I am alone. Can it be that there is no return from this journey, no home gathering to look forward to? Is it real and not a sorrowful dream that those dearest to me lie beneath the cold sod? Ah, oh, it is indeed true, he says. But not more so than that there is a homecoming awaiting me which no parting shall break into. He says, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Is not one part of that preparation the peopling of heaven with those we love? Do you see what he's saying? Jesus is preparing heaven for us and one of the ways in which he's preparing heaven for us is by peopling it with, the, with those that we've loved who've gone on before. And oh, what a homecoming we have to look forward to. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage, comfort, the word is parakaleo, the same word Jesus uses of the Holy Spirit. Courage, encourage and comfort each other with these words. Death is gain for the Christian, but we must never underestimate the pain of loss for those who are left behind. It is part of the curse of sin which Jesus came to abolish. And therefore, let us do all in our power while we live, to live to the hilt in every situation that we believe to be the will of God, as Jim Elliot puts it, and seek to leave a heritage of faith behind that will not only carry our bereaved loved ones, but lead them closer to our Saviour. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. And so, live purposely. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Tim Jackson, in his little booklet on dealing with grief, says this, quotes this story, and I want to close with this. I went trout fishing with my dad and younger brother this past year. We fished in a little stream where my grandfather and I had fished 30 years together 30 years ago. He's buried in a little country cemetery at the top of a hill overlooking the stream. I'd never been to the grave and dad asked if I wanted to stop there. I said yes. My tears surprised me. I didn't expect them. After all, he had been gone 14 years already. I should have been over my grief. And yet that day I came to realize that we are never very far from the pain of those we have lost. It also made me aware of how much God in his infinite wisdom had chosen to use my grandfather to touch my life with his life in profoundly enriching ways instilling in me a hunger for his God. I have never been the same. I'll never get over that. I never should. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort, encourage one another with these words. Amen.